All right. Good evening. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us um, for this Microsoft Reactor workshop this day. This day. Uh, my name is Erika, and I am the program manager at Microsoft Reactor Stoc Stockholm. Before we begin, I would like to kind of ask you to check in via the link above and use the event ID 14236. With that, you'll also, uh, you'll also receive event resources that our hosts has prepared for you to be able to get the maximum out of this session today. Um, the reactors, as you know, are community hubs where founders, developers, startups come to meet and learn from experts from Microsoft, its partners and open, open source community. And it's also a home for the Microsoft for Startups program. With diverse fix on of uh, hands on workshops and community events, there is something for everyone. Um, you can check out our events on meetup.com and join our upcoming sessions. Um, but before we begin, a quick word about the Microsoft Code of Conduct. Um, we all come from different backgrounds, so let's just be aware of each other, be friendly and patient, and after all, we are all here uh, to learn. Thank you. Um, our event guidelines, um, the video is not going to be enabled for anybody um, for this session or security reasons. Um, questions, if you have questions, please do ask them throughout the session and um, our, our presenters are very, very happy, going to be very happy to answer your questions. And if you do need closed captionings, it is available as well. But now let's move on to the reason why we are all here today. In today's session, we are joined by Sandro Speth and Malte Reinmann, who are both Microsoft Code and Student Ambassadors from Germany. Um, Sandra, Sandro and Malte will walk us through how to build a shared shopping list as a chatbot using the Microsoft Bot framework. I think that sounds just so much fun. <laughs> um, I can definitely see this using this in my family. Um, but uh, this session will run for approx approximately 60 minutes. Um, and yes, um, now let's welcome Sandro and Malte. Hi, guys. Thank you so hey. much for joining today and hosting. Thanks for having hosting. us here. Yes, thank you. Um, I think it is time for me now to hand over the word to you. I will switch off my camera, but I'll be in the background listening if I'm needed, and I will help you moderate the chat as well. OK, so um, yeah, it's up to you now. <laughs> thank thank you. you for the introduction, Erica. And if you have any questions, just type in, in the chat and Erika will make sure that we'll answer them. I'm Malte. Um, I'm a Microsoft Learn student ambassador and studying computer science for my bachelor's degree. Uh, currently, I'm doing an exchange semester in California, and I'm excited to have this workshop with you and Sandro. Yeah, hello from my side. My name is Sandro. I studied Bachelor of Computer Science and Master Software Engineering at the University of Stuttgart in Germany. And right now I'm a PhD student also in Stuttgart. And obviously we both are gold Microsoft Learn student ambassadors, as you can read there. Okay, let's get started with the workshop. And how about we start with a small motivation? As students um, living together in shared apartments, when we cook, we need to organize a shopping list so that we can get all the ingredients. Well, using regular chat like WhatsApp doesn't always work out. And then we often forget an ingredient. For example, we might forget the milk, which is unfortunate. So we thought why don't we build a bot that can manage the shopping list for us? With the bot, we can still have our chat and all the context of it and don't need to worry about forgetting an item. This way, next time we won't forget the milk for sure. Oh. 
Okay, so let's take a brief look at our architecture. We built our shopping list bot as a component-based architecture and the heart of our system is obviously the bot itself. You can see it on the upper left corner. The bot uses the Microsoft Lewis service, which means language understanding intelligence service. And we use that to process our messages via natural language processing. So, for example, we can write add two kilogram of bananas and our Lewis API will tell us that the bot, so it will tell the bot that it should add a new item, which item bananas and how many two kilogram. And using all those information, the bot decides which as a function it will call and we have several functions for each purpose in case of adding a new item the call would uh, call the bot would call the add item as a function which then adds this new shopping list item into our cosmos db so before we take a look into code let's take a briefer look into Louis language understanding. I already gave this brief sentence as an example, so we can write messages. It doesn't necessarily need to have all those types of information, so we can also only write add or add bananas. And Louis will then identify the intent of the message and named entities. So the intent is basically what we want to do with that. If we have a word like add or something similar, our Lewis service will identify the intent add. If we have this get or find or something like that, our Lewis service uh, would find the intent get. And then we have two entities. One is the item we want to add, which is bananas. And the second one is the unit we want to add. So at the end, each item in our shopping list will have um, an item entity and optionally also will have, uh, we will have the unit entity. So we can add items without a unit, but we cannot add units without an item for obvious reasons. So how does a bot look like? A chatbot usually consists of dialogues. A dialogue is a back and forth of messages. We have here an example where we just write add and then the bot will ask us which item we want to add. We can answer this question and so on. So this back and forth is called a dialogue and each dialogue consists of several steps. Sorry, start... Sandra. Sorry, yes? somebody can't see the shared screen. OK, is the problem for everyone or? Um. One, one person has written in the chat. I can see. But, um, you can see it. So um, I guess if only one person has this problem, I can try to reshare. And hopefully this works. Otherwise, I would suggest to relog into our call. So now you should be able again to see it, at least the ones who can see it. Yeah, I think most of them, most of the people, um, our guests can see it. Uh, yeah, they point out the solution. So the person who can see it, yeah, somewhere he. Uh, yes, it's all good now. Slide, yeah. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Carry on. Thank you for uh, everybody's help as well. <laughs> Yeah, um, OK, let's continue. So hopefully now everyone works, everything works. Where did we stop? I think with the steps. So each dialogue consists of one or multiple steps, and we start our dialogues with the initial step, deciding which intent we want to have. So if we write this add message, then we obviously have the add intent. This is an easy task for Louis and our bot will then continue with adding an item and the respective steps. For adding an item, we have this items name step to add the items name, 
and also a unit step if we want to add a unit. So let's take a look into code. I think you should be able to see my Visual Studio code instance. Yes, we can. Right. OK, so when you clone our project from GitHub, the structure basically looks like that. I will just collapse it. Um, so we have two main folders. The one is for the Azure Functions, and we have also one for our shopping list bot. We will first take a look into this shopping list bot and continue later with the functions. In our shopping list bot, we have the source folder containing all TypeScript sources we have. And each bot starts with its main dialog, which basically decides which other dialogs are um, called later on. So in case we send a message to add a new item, for example, only add or add two kilogram of bananas or add apples, whatever, then this main dialog will call our add item dialog, which I already have opened here. And we want to explain how such a dialog looks like in TypeScript code using this add item dialog. So there are predefined dialogues, for example, a cancel and help dialogue, which you can extend. So by inheritance, you can create your own dialogues that your bot can use then. So we created a add item dialogue, which is a cancel and help dialogue. And in a constructor, you need to provide an ID, a string, how you want to call this dialogue, and you can also add other dialogues and prompts. So we can add the text prompt and the waterfall dialogue, which are directly provided by the Microsoft Bot Framework. So we don't have to implement them ourselves. A text prompt is just a simple text prompt in our chatbot, and a waterfall dialogue is this special kind of dialogue which consists of multiple steps. So as a result, we can have own dialogues and these dialogues can implement, I can add predefined dialogues, but also other dialogues which we implement ourselves as this unit dialogue is. And for each prompt or other dialogue, we need to also provide a, an identifier, for example, unit dialogue or text prompt. They are not only text prompts, you can also have a choice prompt or something else. So um, yeah, our add item dialogue consists of a waterfall dialogue. And this waterfall dialogue has three steps, which we can see below here. The first one is the item name step. So we already skipped this initial step, which is done in our main dialog. So we can, we know we want to add a new item and now the question is which item and whether we want to have a unit or not. Great, in case we already provided some information about our item in the first initial message, Lewis would have identified these information, for example, the item's name, uh, apples, flour, pizza, you name it. And this information is stored in this step context dot options. So we can store some information in the step context dot options across those steps. We will use that to build, gradually build our item. So in case we have more information than nothing, we already have a semi-built or completely built item. And if not, we will build it throughout these steps. So first we will take a look whether we already have an item name. If not, we will create this question. I mean, the bot will create this question to the user to provide a name for this app. And the bot will also provide a message which expects an input uh, provided by the user. And this input is provided via a text prompt. 
So the framework takes care of that. You don't have to implement this action, how to get the message from this chat into this message object here. Um, you can just use this message factory. And if the user added a name, we will have this name here and we can return this uh, name and continue with the next step. If we provided a name previously in our initial step, we will just skip this step and continue with the query unit step. So for the query unit step, we will definitely have the, the item name for this step context.result. The step context.result contains always the return value of the previous step. So for this item, item name step, we either return the input of our user or this item name already identified by Lewis. And then we have to add this item name into our step context.options in case it was not there already. Otherwise, we just override it. Um, the problem for this step stuff is that we finish our step here with this return. So we cannot add this to our options directly. Therefore, we need to add this in the next step. That's also why we have this final step at the end to finally build our item. OK, so we have this item name in our item. And um, the next question is whether we already have a unit. If we already have provided a unit in our initial step, we can also skip this query unit step and continue with the final step. If not, we will start this unit dialog, which pauses our uh, add item dialog, queries the user for our um, unit, which can have a, um, for example, kilogram or liters or something like that, but it doesn't necessarily have to. So we can also say four, four apples, for example. And when we have a unit, we continue with the final step where we ultimately build our item for the shopping list together. We add this dialogue ID. This is quite important because we are um, we identify our shopping lists throughout the dialogue IDs. And so each dialogue has a ID. It's also called conversation ID, and we use that to identify all our shopping lists. And at the end, we end our dialogue. So the main dialogue can continue with adding or sending this created item to our um, Azure function. OK, are there any questions so far regarding those steps? If not, we can continue. No questions yet. Perfect. Um, OK, I will switch to PowerPoint again. OK. And so now we are back at the architecture overview and Sandro has showed you or given you an introduction to Luis and showed you how the bot works. So now let's take a look at the right hand side of our architecture. As you can see, we separated the logic for the bot from the logic of our backend. Our backend is implemented in Azure function and its only functionality is to provide operations on a shopping list. And these operations then store the shopping list in a Cosmos DB. So on the next slide, um, we will introduce Azure Functions to you. And for you to understand Azure Functions, we've come up with this analogy. So on the left hand side, you see a wood fire pizza oven which in our case will represent a traditional server. And on the right hand side, you see a oven like you might have at home, which is going to represent the Azure functions. So what are the benefits of a traditional server? Well, there are certainly some use cases where an Azure and a traditional server is 
beneficial over Azure Functions. Most lame, namely, uh, most importantly, Azure Functions need some startup time when they are called and to um, for Azure to call the right code and provision the resources for it to run. Whereas the pizza, the wood-fired pizza oven in a restaurant runs all day, so it's always ready like a traditional server. There's no warm-up time. Furthermore, the traditional server uh, might bring or might be more easier to go into the cloud when we have a legacy application where if we are writing something from scratch or building something uh, or rewriting a legacy application and we want it to be cloud native, Azure Function is definitely the way to go if we don't have any edge case in our application. So let's look at the advantages the Azure Functions have. Well, in a restaurant, the pizza usually takes a bit longer, whereas in our oven at home, we can cook quickly and make a pizza, pizza, which is probably the reason why we don't go out for dinner at a restaurant every day, but rather like after a long day of work, we prefer to make it at home. So just like that, Azure Functions can handle um, as many requests or as little by scaling up and down easily which is all done by the cloud provider, in this case, Azure, for ours. So we get scalability for free. Furthermore, Azure takes care of all the underlying um, server. So Azure functions are also referred to as the serverless paradigm. This doesn't mean that we don't have a server. It rather means that the server becomes less important and we as the programmer care more about the code. So the Azure functions work by having different scripts for the different code. So imagine them like recipes. In your oven, you don't just cook, uh, cook pizzas, but you have different recipes for different foods. Just like the recipes, we have different scripts to handle different operations. So in our case, you can see the operations here, which are the, um, if they fly in, which are the operation to add an item to our shopping list, to get all items in our shopping list, to update all items, and to remove an item from the shopping list. So each operation corresponds to a different script. And when we call the endpoint for the operation, Azure spins up the necessary resources to run our script and we only wrote the code. And the next slide, now that you understand the Azure functions, we will look into what we use for storing our shopping lists. We need some database to persist them. So the Azure functions, when adding an item, for example, apples to the shopping list, talk to a database to store them. Well, what options do we have for database? On the left hand side, again, we have a food analogy. Our, uh, is a bento box that represents a relational database, for example, SQL. And on the right hand side, we have this takeout box, which symbolizes the Cosmos DB. Here again, both are valid options and both are nice things to eat. So let's just contrast them. The bento box is, as you can see, neatly arranged, just like a relational database where we have a set schema which defines um, the tables of our databases and the relationships between them. On the other hand, the takeout box is more like a container where we can put in different ingredients to make up the dish. So it's less organized. We don't have a set schema. We rather have a container in which we can store documents, most commonly um, JSON documents to represent the different data that we um, store, that we want to store in this database. So on the next slide, uh, you can see that for this workshop, we decided to go with the Cosmos DB. That doesn't mean that 
it's always the best option. But for us, the flexibility that uh, and scalability that Cosmos DB brings is a significant advantage. And furthermore, because everything in our project is written in TypeScript, it's very easy to serialize the JSON, uh, the objects to JSON and just put them in a database and don't have to worry about the schema and so on. Now that you understand the two technologies we use for our backend, namely the Azure Functions and the Cosmos DB, let's have Sandro walk you through the Azure Functions code. I mean, we can also manage that. Manage. We can also mention that Cosmos DB is basically a container for several other databases. So you can have a relational SQL database, but you can also have a unstructured document database like MongoDB. OK, let's continue with the code. So I guess you should see my Visual Studio code again. And um, yeah, we are done with our bot and we can continue with our functions. So in this function folder, we have subfolders for each functions, for example, Add item, get items, uh, services, uh, sorry, remove all items, and so on. And we also have models for the item, an item as we store it in the database and the stuff a unit contains. So um, the unit name and the value. Let's take a look into this add item function. So each function consists of a function.json which has the input and output bindings. So in our case, we have a input binding as an HTTP trigger, so we can call this Azure function via an HTTP call. That is not necessarily the case for every Azure function. So you can also trigger them via messaging or if a document was added to a database, stuff like that. And we don't need any enemies any authorization so everyone can just call it. As the request method we use HTTP post and the bot can send its newly to add items um, under the URL add item function slash and then the shopping list ID which was our conversational ID or dialogue ID. And as a result we get HTTP responses like 400 bad, bad requests, 201 created with the item we created, stuff like that. And then this function.json also specifies which script file contains the function. So as we are writing in TypeScript, we need to tell our Azure function that the function itself is obviously in this dist folder where the compiled stuff is and it's called index.json which we won't take a look because we have this TypeScript uh, function. Every TypeScript Azure function looks similar. We have this constant function here. We call it HTTP trigger. It's of type Azure function and it will return a promise. So we have as arguments the context and this request object. And at the beginning we will or we can validate our shopping list ID. So we will check whether our shopping list ID is valid or not. And if not, we will return this bad request for 100. And if yes, we continue with adding a new item to our Cosmos DB stuff. For our um, database interaction, we wrote this Cosmos DB service, which is basically a helper service containing several operations. For example, to add a new item or to re remove new item and so on. Each of those operations will first check whether all information is valid. So do we really have an item? Do we really have an item name? Is this item name an empty string or not? And if there's any problem, we will throw an error, which will then be catched in our function again. And if everything is okay, we will get 
this collection. A collection is basically a folder containing all those unstructured uh, JSON documents. And within this collection, we will search for every item having the same shopping list ID as our item to add. We count these items, increment this count by one, and then we can get our position. Um, so why do we need the position in our shopping list? We decided also to offer the user some options to, for example, check an item by its position. For example, if we have a shopping list containing three elements, the first one is apples, the second one is flour, and the third one is uh, bananas, the user should also be able to say, check the third item, and then the bot should check the, this banana item. And since we don't know the exact position in our shopping list from the point of view of our bot, because it's basically stateless, uh, we need to find out this position when adding the item to our database. When we have this position, we can create this document containing the shopping list ID and also the item to add, which then also has the shopping list position as an additional property. And the result of this insertion, that we retrieve the item and we will return this item to our function itself. But in any case, so in case there's an error or in case everything worked well, we need to close this client. Otherwise we have an open uh, connection, which we don't want to have. So we are back here. Um, we got back our item, which we added. In case it worked successfully, then we can return this item via status code 201. And if there was an error, we catch this, uh, this error, create a response object with body containing with a body containing our error message. And um, yeah, as you can see here, this returning stuff out of the Azure function always works with this context. So context dot result uh, contains then the this JSON we want to return to our callee. And this context dot data bindings dot shopping list is our shopping list ID. So this data bindings are defined in our functions dot JSON. And each other um, parameter we need to get it from the request body of our post request. Okay, I think we can continue with our deployment. Are there yes. any questions so far? I don't think so. And while I get my screen share up and running, I have a yeah, question questions. for our audience. Or oh, there are no questions. Okay. Uh, then I have a question for you. Um, do you guys um, think we will be able to manage the deployment of all these components? Just answer in the chat and I'll start my screen share while you do that. Okay, now you should see my screen. Yes, at least I can see it. Perfect. Well, to answer the question, um, yes, we are going to deploy all, all the resources for our project. That's the nice thing about having something, a cloud native application. It's often involves clicking many things in the Azure portal but we don't have to worry about the hardware and all the difficulties ourselves. Well, you've briefly seen all the different parts that make up the shopping list project. To get more into detail of each of them, please look at the GitHub. But now that you know about them, we need to take them and tie them all together so they can work with each other. For that, we will go through first how to create the different resources we need. Then we wire everything up. And lastly, we will deploy the code. So let's start by creating resources for Luis. So here we are in the Azure portal and we create a new resource. We search for the Luis language understanding. 
we create that resource in a new resource group. For those of us, for those of you who don't know Azure that well, a resource group is basically a container through which we can manage uh, resources that are related. For example, in our case, all the resources for the shopping list project. The LUIS itself contains two resources, the authoring resource and the prediction resource. The authoring resource is where you as the developer define or uh, specify the model. So you want to have it close to where your developers are located. The pre prediction resource on the other hand is then where your model runs and where requests can be made to to uh, run and predict um, the entities and intents of a request that is sent to it. So that you want to have close to our to your users. So let's wait a second to Azure provisions the resources and then we'll switch the browser tabs. Um, sorry if it's cut off, but we will go to luis.ai and that's the portal where we can manage our Luis application. So once it's loaded, we will need to select the resource that we just created in Azure, the Luis resource. And then we would st start and create a new Luis application. For this, we are going to take the short route and import the existing application of our project as a JSON. If you want to know how we got to that JSON, there are detailed instructions in the GitHub, but for brevity, we will simply import it because through the import, we already have everything in here. So you can see the different intents for the shopping list. For example, adding an item is one intent that we focused on. And here it already imported for us all the sentences that are examples for Luis to train a model that can recognize that intent. Now we started training the model and Luis um, takes care of creating a model from all these intents and entities. And once it's trained, uh, you can see, but on the top right, there's a publish button. So we will click that and then we will select production. And with that, it will publish the model so we can access it through uh, URLs. We need to select the prediction resource that we created in Azure. And then we'll come back to this screen later because here we have all the information to access this Luis model. Now that we have the uh, Luis, let's see how we create a um, Cosmos DB in Azure. We go back to the Azure portal again and create a new resource. We we'll search for the Cosmos DB and add it to the same um, resource group as the uh, Luis resources in. For this project, we decided to go with the MongoDB API, which we just selected, and then we will need to give it an, a name for the database. So we will just type in shopping list um, reactor and then the location. We will also select the one as we did with Luis, which is close to us and all the other options, the default ones are fine. So we go ahead and create this database. And once it's deployed, we are all done for that and we will come back to it later when wiring everything up. The next resource we need is an Azure function. So back in the Azure portal again, we create an Azure function in the same resource group. An Azure function has an URL which we can call it. So this one needs to be unique. So we need to come up with a unique name, which sometimes is tricky, but we can manage it and then we select a runtime stack. In our case, we use Node.js and all the default options, the version you should always use the latest, of course, and then select your region of preference. And then we go ahead and let Azure create it. And once it's created, we will have a look how we can wire the Azure functions so that it can um, access the Cosmos DB database. So for that, we will need to go to our resource group. This one was the wrong one. Let's go back. And the shopping list bot react to resource group. When we have it selected, we can already see all the resources we just provisioned previously, and we will select the 
database. And now we need to get the information how to connect to that database. So on the left hand side, we go to the quick start action and select our Node.js runtime platform. And here it basically shows you how to use the MongoDB when calling from Node.js code. So because our Azure function is written in Node.js, we copy this connection string. And we did that while our Azure function uh, is finished up its deployment and we can go to the resource for the Azure functions. Now, to get the connection string in code, we use um, um, runtime variables, which we can configure here right in the Azure portal. So we add a new application setting and give it a name. This name needs to be the same as in our code. So in our code, we call it the um, shopping list uh, connect uh, Cosmos DB. And we in the value field, we paste in the connection string we copied previously. With that done, we now can access that application setting in our code and through that connect through to the Cosmos DB database. It's of course always important to save the connection or the configuration, and then we move on. Here in this video, we look at the resources we need to create for the bot. So we have here a local terminal open, and the first thing we will do is we will log into the Azure command line interface. And this opens the browser where you can log in. And then once we are logged in, we get back here and um, we can use the Azure command line to manage our Azure resources just like we would in the Azure portal. So it's just a different interface for basically similar functionalities. The first thing we will do is we will create an application in the Azure Active Directory. Applications are um, identities of applications as the name says. So like you and I have an identity as a person, apps can also have an identity through which others can use the apps. So we gave it a name, a password, please, if you deploy this, use better passwords, of course, and we specify that it can be used by other tenants. So not just as student ambassadors, but other people. The important part here is to copy the app ID. This we will need in the next command that we execute. So this next command will create all the resources needed for a bot. And for that, bot projects provide um, helpful templates that we can define through the template file parameter. There, all the Azure resources are defined that need to be created, and we simply provide all the information. So the app ID from the previous command, which is the app ID of the Azure Active Directory app, then the same password, the bad password. Um, we also need to give the bot a name. So we haven't done that previously. We need to come up with a name here. And this is basically how the bot will present itself. And because bots run basically are a web server, we also need to create an, a web app in Azure, and so we give it the parameters or the name for that, which we can also come up right here. Lastly, we define the um, location again, and we provide a name for this single deployment. So you can basically name it whatever, or if you want to do like version deployment, you of course would want to give it a more meaningful name. What this command does is it creates, it takes all the parameters we specified and it creates the web app in Azure. And it also creates the channel registrations, which are then, which define or which tell different platforms, different chat platforms, for example, Teams or Telegram or Skype or Outlook, how to call the bot because the bot is basically just a web server. So now that this is done, we've created all the resources. We created the language understanding application. We've created the Cosmos DB, the Azure functions and the bot. Now we have all these individual resources and we need to wire them together. We already provided the connection between the 
Azure Functions and the Cosmos DB. And now we will look into how we can connect the bot to be able to call the Azure Functions. For that, we go back to the Azure portal and now we can see there are more resources. There are the resources we just created in the command line for the bot. Um, we open the function app in a new tab and open the shopping list app servers right here. So this is our web app running the bot. Again, we provide the configuration um, through application settings, which we'll open here. The first thing we'll do is connect the bot to the Azure Functions. So we go over to the Azure Functions tab and here in the overview, you can see the URL where we can reach our Azure Functions. So we will copy that and create it as a new application setting. Again, the name needs to be the same as in the code. However, the value is of course the URL of your function and we've written our code that we expect it to be under the API endpoint. Next, now that we have the Azure Functions and the bot talking to each other, we need the bot talk to the Luis. For that, we go back to the Luis.ai portal and first thing we do is copy the app ID. The app ID uniquely identifies our Luis uh, application and we enter it here. Um, so here we had a spelling mistake, so um, we need of course the same name as in the code and now that we have the app ID, let's get the remaining information. The more information we need is where can we call the Luis resource and that depends on the location. So our Luis is in West US, so we copy that and then the URL is made of the location and then a predefined a string by Azure, so it's like dot, uh, so the location dot API dot cognitive services. Um, you also see it right here, um, dot Microsoft.com. So that's specified by Microsoft how we can, where we can find Luis. And lastly, we will need to uh, not, so not everyone can call Luis, we will need to provide the key, which uh, basically authenticates the bot to be able to call or allows the bot to be able to call Luis. And so we copy the primary key from the Luis portal and paste it in here. With that, we have the connection between the Cosmos DB and the Azure Functions and the connections between the bot and the Azure functions and the bot and the Luis application. So now we've taken all the resources and connected them together. In the next step, because these resources are not specific to our shopping list yet, we will deploy our shopping list code to the resources. So our code that you saw was for the um, bot as well as the Azure functions. They are all stored in GitHub and we are using uh, GitHub Actions to continuously deploy them. So we only, the only thing is we need to tell GitHub how to deploy them to Azure. So in the app service for the shopping list bot, for the bot, we can go to the deployment center and download the published profile that contains all the information we need to give GitHub so that GitHub is able to deploy to Azure. Open that profile, um, open that profile in your um, preferred text editor and copy all the content. Then go to the um, GitHub uh, clone of our project and go to the settings and secrets and add a new repository secret. In our um, GitHub actions, we have defined all the steps that GitHub should take to deploy it. So you can look into them in more details and they are also described. For, for this workshop, we will also only go over how to connect them. So as you can see, we um, use the name how we access the published profile through the GitHub Actions and we pasted all the content that we copied from the file. We will do the same for the um, function app. So. To reiterate, we go to the deployment center in Azure of the resource that we want to publish to from GitHub. 
we download the published profile, which tells GitHub how it can um, publish to Azure. So how it, GitHub can establish the connection to Azure or more specifically to our resource. We copy all its content and go over to GitHub and add it as a repository secret, which um, makes the value, the connection profile available to the action. Now that we have that defined for the bot as well as the Azure functions, we can go to the actions tab in GitHub and we can run our actions. Now we will run them manually, but usually we would do it automatically, of course, when we have changes. That's the whole point of continuous delivery, of course. So now we started them and they take a little while, so we will check back once they are done running. In this last video, we can see both um, actions have run. And now our code for the Azure functions as well as the bot are deployed. In the last step, we will go and configure so the bot so that we can write to it in Microsoft Teams. For that, we open the bot channel registration resource, which is specific to the bot, unlike the web server where the bot actually runs, which is generic. Here under the channels, we can see all the different platforms that we can make our bot available. So these are all the chat platforms you know that can create a connection to our bot if we specify it. Each platform has its own process to register a bot, but for Microsoft Teams here in the uh, channels tab, it's very easy to get started for testing purposes. Microsoft Teams has different ways to provide applications. In our case, we could see it's a messaging application and we simply um, saved it so now we have not just the web chat but also microsoft teams as a channel and through that link we can simply open uh, microsoft teams and it redirects us to the bot uh, once it's loaded and then we can see the finished product when it's loaded and can write to our bot so that's now the interesting part where we can see all the code that we went through in action. So that's the familiar chat interface of Teams. And when we um, tell the bot that we are here, we want to do something, um, it will ask us what operation we want to um, execute. So let's, for example, add some apples to our shopping list. And as you can see, we can type any format of sentences and Luis recognizes the language and extracts the intent which is add and then what we want to add so that way the shopping list can add the five apples. However if we don't fully specify in one sentence what we want to add the bot will ask us all the details that it needs. So now that they ask us, we add spinach as the second item on our shopping list, and we also want to add a unit. So we add uh, specify the amount of spinach that we want. So let's do 250 or 250 grams. And then the spinach will be on our shopping list as well. Now the data is stored in the Cosmos DB and we can retrieve it. We could also go away and retrieve it later. And we can see here this adaptive card that pops up that shows us our shopping list and lets us interact with it by checking the checkboxes to specify which items we already bought and saving it. With that, um, you saw all the functionality of our bot. And um, we can go over back to the slide, Sandro. Sure. In the meantime, while I'm sharing the slides again, you can also test your bots during development using this uh, Microsoft Bot Framework emulator. Uh, I guess you can see the slides now. Yes. Um, so you don't need to deploy your bot for Microsoft Teams or Telegram, whatever you want. Okay, we continue with the limitations of our project. So currently we don't have any 
text similarity, which means if you have a typo, for example, if you want to say check bananas and you don't write bananas correctly, it will not match to the existing bananas in our shopping list. Um, I mean, this is just a matter of implementation, so you can add text similarity in case you want to have it. We also do not have any authentication, so currently we do not need to authenticate against our bot. Uh, we don't have any accounts or stuff like that. Uh, also, these conversation IDs, which we use to identify our shopping lists, are not quite clear from the documentation, so we don't really know whether they eventually will change or not, so if they are immutable or not. If they might change, this could be a problem for our bot because then the shopping lists are uh, lost and we cannot identify them again. Uh, so we need to log in to Azure and remove them uh, and find out another way to identify our shopping lists. Also, our current bot is not yet channel specific. So for example, for Teams deployment, we can't, can't do any reactions with our bot or stuff like that. There are also some lessons learned we had when doing or preparing this workshop. The first one is that it's a complete different approach to build a bot. We have messages in a dialogue style instead of having a normal program flow and UI. You can see this already with the steps and having this context.options, which is globally available, and this context.result, which contains the return value of the previous step. So this isn't stuff you would implement in a normal program flow, but that's how the bot works. Um, we also mentioned the, this emulator, which you can use to test your bot. There's one big disadvantage. The emulator does not really support group chats. So in our motivation scenario, we had this group chat in our family. Um, you cannot test something like that with this emulator. The documentation states otherwise, but we could not manage to get more than one chat participant into this emulator. Also, we first started to use the SQL SQL API for Cosmos DB instead of our MongoDB, which we eventually did at the end. Um, and we used the uh, SQL API bindings for Azure Functions. So you can have in this JSON object and this JSON files bindings, which makes the whole database interaction much easier because you can basically simply say, hey, you get an item validated and send it to the Cosmos DB without writing so much code as we did now. But unfortunately for SQL, this uh, bindings only can create items and also the Cosmos DB using an SQL API can not um, update items. So we can add items, perhaps we can remove items using a SQL API client, but somehow we cannot um, update them. So we can, yeah. Um, and last but not least, in our personal object, objective, uh, we thought that a lot of the documentation is not really sufficient. So there's many confusing documentation around regarding uh, bots and adaptive cards, Cosmos DB with Mongo. So you need to read a lot and usually we ended up with trial and error. Okay, as this workshop was created for others to do, we have also a train for trainers, uh, which we will skip due to time reasons. So we are at the end of our presentation now. Um, yeah, thank you very much for listening to us and we hope you liked it. Are there any questions?